Thank you all, and I'm so glad you've had some talks about Abaitis already this morning so I don't have to introduce you to the site because we are, as you can see from my title, we're going to be talking about 4,000 years worth of material. There's way more than I can give you in 20 minutes, but I hope I can give you a little taste of what we've been doing. The Brown University Abaitis Project was founded in 2008, and we've been working in some very restricted locations within the North, North Cemetery in Abaitis. But the amount of material we found is truly astonishing and spans a great amount of time. So we're working up in here. And the, the goals of the project have from the beginning been diachronic. So we have been from the beginning trying to understand changes in this sacred landscape over time. The fact that we have this 4,000 year span of stuff is really quite astonishing. My own early interest in the area was developed out of my interest in, in early kingship and the early funerary enclosures from here. Two years ago, I was forced to fall in love with the Ptolemaic period. And as you will see this year, I have been forced to fall in love with the late Roman period. I could not avoid it. So I hope to show you some of what's so exciting about our finds. But I also wanted to structure this talk around another goal of ours that's become important, which is to use a variety of means of recording the site. None of the ways that we've brought this new recording to, to Abaitis are in, them, in themselves particularly unique. But by trying to capture different visual and other methods of recording the site, really we're trying to bring a bunch of stuff together to create a holistic experience of being in Abaitis. I find one of the hardest things to communicate to people who have not been to the site is a sense of space, of being there. And so we have been playing with a great deal of new and old techniques for documenting the site in ways that are maybe not so typical for archaeologists. And I'm going to introduce you to these methods of recording. You'll then see them in reference to our specific discoveries as we go through. And I should say from the beginning, none of this would be possible if I didn't have an amazing team. So my grad students have had amazing ideas about new techniques we can bring, uh, colleagues and friends. We run this budget, we run this project on a shoestring. Uh, but we've done, I hope, some amazing work. I hope you all agree. So one of the things we've done, for instance, is to bring a watercolorist out, and we've been documenting the landscape of Abydos, both natural and cultural, using not just photography, but painting, which I think in many ways is more evocative than photography. Here you see an image of the, the village of Dersit Damiana. This is a Coptic village immediately adjacent to where we're digging. And if we're going to talk about change in landscape over time and cultural use over time, the fact that this is still a living landscape is incredibly important. So you have here what is probably a Ptolemaic wall, and there's a medieval to modern village still within this ancient enclosure. I think the watercolors help us capture that very well. We've been using infrared photography. Here you see this as applied to one of our very numerous demotic ostraca. Um, these ostraca are virtually illegible in many cases when we find them, but the infrared photography has popped up the inscription quite beautifully. We've also been using a photographic technique called reflectance transformation imaging. Reflectance transformation imaging captures from a still photographic setup, captures numerous images, usually about 60 to 80, with the light source in different places. This is something my graduate student Catherine Howley has brought to us. Um, she's been trained in this. And here you see a standard image, a standard photographic image of a stela fragment that we found this year. And then using the RTI, which is a, a composite then of these images with the light source in different places, you can see how much clearer the detail becomes. So this has helped us you know, from the macro, from site-wide looking at space and recording it using watercolors to the micro to using uh, photographic techniques to look at objects. We've been really playing with seeing. This has also been important for our surveying. We've been doing some adventure surveying. One of the buildings I will introduce you to today is an underground set of vaulted chambers. It was built in the Ptolemaic period and used for a while in the Ptolemaic period, reused them in the late Roman period. Because it's underground and intact, we actually have no lines of sight from our survey points down into this. And so even though we found this building in 2010, we were only able this season finally to get in there and begin surveying. We've been doing the survey, we've been doing photogrammetry down here as well, and we're knitting the two together to create a photogrammetric 3D model. And unfortunately, my computer wasn't running from up here. I wanted to, to walk you through. My student, Ian Brownstein, over here, has been create, using the photogrammetric model here, bringing it into gaming software, in fact, to create an interactive model so that you can walk through a, a, an actually accurate, photographically derived model of this building. 
we're going to use this, we're going to create several layers on this so you can walk through it as it is, but also so that you can walk through it in its earlier phases. A lot of fun. So these are the ways we were trying to record and then communicate about the site, but what have we actually found? And again, this is going to, I'm going to go chronologically here in terms of the finds. As I said, my initial interest in this area was in the early dynastic period, in the first dynasty funerary enclosures. As you've already seen, the landscape of Abydos is marked by the funerary enclosure of Casa Chemwi of the second dynasty. That is the last of the known funerary enclosures. This type of monument really is a, a type of temple built by the early kings who were buried at Omel Gab. We're trying to, and have been trying for many years now, this project started by NYU, and I've been very fortunate to keep working on this in parallel to NYU. Uh, we've been really trying to understand the history of this type of monument, how these monuments individually were used, but then also how the monument type was originally made, what they, how they relate to early kingship. And here, in our very restricted area that we're digging inside the modern Coptic cemetery, we were fortunate enough two years ago to find the remains of part of a wall of a previously unknown funerary enclosure. In the past two seasons, we have continued to explore this structure, uh, finding this is actually in the street. This was a horrible operation to excavate. We had, had to go outside of the cemetery. This is a road right here, and we had tractors driving by us constantly on the edge of this. It doesn't look very impressive, but those of you who know me know that I love white bricks. Nothing makes me more excited. And you have here, in fact, the corner of this enclosure. You can see, I hope, some of the niching pattern on this. So this is the northwest corner of this enclosure. This was an important find last year because it, it started to show us the dimensions of that enclosure. Now, in addition to the architecture from this, this enclosure, this new enclosure, we have a great deal of ceramics. These ceramics have got to come from a subsidiary grave. We haven't found the grave yet. It may be lost beneath the cemetery, but the ceramics themselves are quite interesting. Although we find them in disturbed contexts, the assemblage as a whole is concentrated enough and in good enough shape that I don't think it can have moved very far. It is a classic Nagata 3C1 funerary assemblage. We've got wine jars, we have cylinder jars, we have beer jars, you see these forms here. We have open form roughware, all of it completely comparable to funerary assemblages dated to the reigns of Narmer and Aha. But I don't have the name on any of this yet. Uh, so I can't tell you whether it's Narmer or Aha, but in particular from last season, as we've started to find architecture, more architecture, that corner, which is somewhat different from the known corners of the Aha enclosures. We also have seal impressions. Unfortunately, that's not showing up in this RTI image, but it's a classic the Nagata 3C1 seal impression as well. Um, I am increasingly comfortable saying that this monument is in fact likely to date to the earlier part of the Nagata 3C1. And in part, I say that not only based on the finds, the architecture, again, this corner is somewhat different, the, the rounded bastion at its corner looks different from the known Aha enclosures, but also because of its geographic location in the cemetery. The progression of funerary enclosures during the early dynastic period is very clearly from the local north, the proper northwest, to the local south. And in fact, no king ever built to the north of his predecessor. We have the Aha enclosures here. We can now put our new enclosure on the map up here. You see that it is the northwestmost known enclosure by the law, it's not a law, by what we have observed in the North Cemetery. This ought to be the earliest. Now that of course is a little bit strange, and it's also, that's, a, that's circumstantial evidence, and I'm loading a lot on it, because if I'm correct that this is a temple built by Narmer, it does in fact rather substantially change our understanding of the very process of building the kingship of Egypt early on. Um, and in part, and here I would have you note, that this enclosure, although we have only found one corner of it, we have found enough of it to make it certain that it is substantially larger than any of the known AHA enclosures. The reason I think that's important, one of the reasons that may be important, is because we can relate these monuments now to what's going on at Umel Gab. And if you look at Umel Gab, of course, you remember that AHA is the first one to have a monumental tomb. The tomb of Narmer, the adjacent presumed tomb of Narmer, is really dinky in comparison. Well, so if Aha is building the first big tomb, perhaps he is diverting resources that Narmer had put into temple building into his tomb, so that the constructions of Aha in total are much larger than those of Narmer, but Narmer's temple itself is larger than those known for Aha. I throw that out as a suggestion. Um, but again, I'm very excited about this building. I'm not, I haven't completely given up on finding a name in association with it, but I'm not sure that we're ever going to be able to answer this question 
for sure. The next remains we have from this area date to the Middle Kingdom. We've known this for quite some time. We have very little architecture from the Middle Kingdom. It's largely been destroyed by later materials, by later building. But we do have a substantial amount of funerary pottery. Here you see a very classic Middle Kingdom, early Middle Kingdom bag jar. We find these by the bucket load. And this season we were fortunate enough to find both a shaft tomb, a very shallow shaft tomb, and what appears to be a chapel of the early Middle Kingdom. I, we have trouble dating this exactly, but it does appear to date late first and immediate period, early Middle Kingdom. One of the reasons this is interesting is because, again, as with the early dynastic material, we are here in the very northern part of the North Cemetery. We know, we've known always, that the North Cemetery was used as a burial ground in the Middle Kingdom. One of the assumptions we've had, however, is that one of the reasons for using the North Cemetery in the Middle Kingdom is because it's adjacent to the wadi that was the processional route between the town site of Abydos and the remodeled tomb at Amal Gab that was considered to be the tomb of Osiris. However, it now appears that the chronological progression within the North Cemetery in the Middle Kingdom actually starts from the north. So the very earliest use of this cemetery is actually as far away from the wadi as you can get. So the wadi itself does not appear to have been, if I'm correct in, in this interpretation, does not appear to have been the motivating factor in using the North Cemetery as a burial ground in the early Middle Kingdom. We'll jump now. So we, we have a little bit of New Kingdom stuff, but it's not so exciting. Anyway, we've gotten some New Kingdom abiders quite recently. We'll jump now to the first millennium, and I will show you some of the exciting stuff we're finding from the Ptolemaic period. Again, just a, a taste. We are excavating in two areas where we have substantial Ptolemaic remains, up in the north near the village of Beni Mansour. We're working on the North Abydos settlement site. This is my graduate student, Timothy Sandiford, is working on this. For a couple of seasons now, we've been exposing a very dense urban landscape, you can see here. It's not only dense horizontally, it's vertical exposure. It's proving to be quite interesting. We have about a meter and a half exposed of the latest Ptolemaic phase of the town, but as we've gotten through the floors of that we haven't removed any walls yet, but as we've gotten through the floors of that, it turns out we have a good two meter or so preserved height of the phase prior to that, which is earlier Ptolemaic. So here you can see, in fact, the walls of the second phase, second Ptolemaic phase, looking down upon a vault that dates somewhat earlier. Um, Tim will be talking about this next year at RC, but some of the finds from here, we continue to just find amazing stuff. So that vault, for instance, had a cache of discarded miniature ceramic vessels they date across the Ptolemaic period. There's almost certainly earlier material under there as well. And there's some late Roman reuse in this settlement site. When we go back to the area of the enclosures, and you can see here the wall of our early dynastic enclosure, walls of our early dynastic enclosure, we can also see Ptolemaic reuse in this landscape. And this building, again, is something we've known for a couple of years. This is our adventure surveying. Um, but our knowledge of this building has increased dramatically over the last two seasons. The basic structure of the building is a set of underground mud brick vaults. There was no superstructure that we know of except for an enclosure wall running around the outside. There was a central vaulted corridor that led off on either side to side vaults. You go down a staircase to get in there. And then once you're in the central vault, you can see these doors leading off on either side. All of these vaults were used for the burial of primar primarily ibis mummies. We do have a couple of other animals as well. We have dogs, we have other birds, we had a snake last year. Uh, this season, not only were we able to survey in here for the first time, but we were also able to excavate inside the side vaults for the first time. You can see here what we did, it's the, the vaults are littered with broken pottery. These ibis jars have been smashed to smithereens in most cases. Um, but we wanted to take samples from each vault so that we could compare the assemblages in each vault, see if we could see differences in use, differences in chronology inside the building itself. So what we started doing is taking one meter strips across the center of each vault. And, and even doing that, takes it takes about 30 minutes to excavate that. And you can see that this, this carpet of shirts here, it then takes about a week to process those shirts. So we didn't get as far as we wanted to. We've only done three vaults so far, but we are hoping um, my student, Catherine McBride, is working on this material. We're hoping to be able to understand more about the initial use of this building. The destruction of the Ida stars, however, is very interesting as well. Here you can see some of the eggs. We also get eggs 
buried. And even in the smashed up jars, we can often see evidence that they were used, actually used for ibis burial. So you get a bit of, of resinous material in the bottom, and then you get the bottoms of these ibis mummies stuck in there. We find very, very few ibis mummies themselves in the side vaults. Very few eggs as well, again, because it's so smashed up. The point cloud upon which we're hanging our, our 3D model. Go there yet. Uh, in any case, so yes, the process of smashing up these jars is also something that I'm very interested in elucidating, and this, uh, I think, is probably due to the latest reuse of this site. We will just skip through this, another watercolor. This is the, another view of the wall of the village of Derisit Damiana. Again, I think it's large, it's probably Ptolemaic. You can see a vault in the original wall beneath the more modern additions to the wall that very closely parallels the vaults that we're finding from the Ptolemaic period underground. This, this village, this wall of this village, was for many, many years assumed to be an early dynastic enclosure. And I've gone over this wall with Matt Adams and again by myself, and we haven't found a single early dynastic brick, and the parts of the wall we find look so similar to our Ptolemaic constructions. I'm pretty comfortable calling this a Ptolemaic building. So the last reuse of this structure, again, is something that we found really, we started to find this a couple of seasons ago, but our biggest finds come from this January. Two of the vaults were reused in the Coptic period as religious and dwelling spaces. In particular, the one that we found, well, Vault 12, that was reused from this season, we found, was extensively remodeled. They not only emptied out the vault, they reconfigured it so there were three underground rooms and then a suite of above-ground rooms. You can see, as we found it, there is nothing more exciting as an archaeologist than finding a staircase going down. And we found this staircase going down into clean sand, we're scooping away the sand. Is there another step? There were always more steps. And this led us down into the central part of that now tripartite X vault, which had been opened up and used as a light well. Here are the rooms from the top. We have a kitchen suite, a red plastered room, a white plastered room. There's a Coptic inscription on this bench in here. There's really a lovely set of spaces. The underground part, so here's our light well, room G. From this light well, we can go into room H, which was part of the original vault, now remodeled, and room I, also remodeled. Room H, fortunately, was in great shape. Room I, not so much. So this is room H. You can see that the original vault is still intact. The space never entirely filled with sand. Again, this is just astonishing as an archaeologist when you can enter a space. Uh, we do have collapse levels in here that smashed a great deal of in situ pottery, especially late Roman amphorae. And there is not a shred of evidence that this space was used after the 6th century. So this is actually fairly early, even by late Roman standards. You can see here the window wells that were created to let light in, all white plastered with red decoration on it. There are extremely close parallels for this material at Edfu, so close that you think there must be architects moving between the two. Unfortunately, room I is much more destroyed. The vault, the top of the vault had collapsed, but we were able to clear this room as well. And you can see here the the white plastering of the bottom parts of this room. One of the reasons the vault collapsed, presumably, is because a large number of niches were carved in the walls, which structurally was not a good idea. However, these niches were, in many cases, brilliantly decorated. Uh, in particular, the niche on the local east side was heavily decorated with images, and the sides had these um, painted pilasters. You can see here faces of saints on either side. The paint in amazing condition. This niche had been provided with a cross. The cross is flanked by Paul and Peter and the feet of Christ, whose head and halo would have been at the very top of that apsidal niche. The walls decorated further with murals. You have here a lion, a lioness. She is suckling her young. She's tethered. This was a, there was a flanking scene on the other side. It's no longer in great shape, but you can see that it was heraldically positioned. And then possibly my favorite, we have on the north wall of this chamber, we have Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac has some interesting hips going on. It's a, the, the, the paintings have a delightful quality. They're sort of naive and sort of not. The, the, the painting of Christ on Peter and Paul is, is without question an expert one. But it's clear that you had people living in this space, worshiping in this space, continuing to decorate it over time. We find in some cases a fairly nicely done image, and then to its side will be a sketch done in, in I assume, charcoal 
um, that in a much rougher hand. So whoever's living there is looking at these images and then adding to them over time. And in fact, we have found the paint pots that were used as well. So the bases of these broken jars, Roman jars in this case, with black ink and brush strokes in the bottom here. So I hope you will agree with me that from the very earliest to the very latest, Avitus continues to surprise and delight us. And I'd like to say thank you to my students and my sponsors.